clearly had a hand in uh, shaping the direction we're going to focus this morning. And uh, thinking about some of the things that happened in our country, things that have been happening in our world for a long time now, the topic of fear is something that I think is very relevant to us. There are many things that would concern us, many things that would make that a temptation to be fearful, to be anxious, to be worried, to be uh, concerned about the things that are happening around us. Uh, just thinking about myself, I, I'm, I'm excited for today in the sense that I feel like what we're going to talk about is impactful in my life. And how about you, but uh, I think as I have, my family has grown, as I got married, as I had Everly, there's more and more things that I feel like I have to be fearful for. I could lose my wife. I could lose my daughter. And that those aspects of as we grow, as we mature, as God maybe blesses us with different things, that temptation to wonder, well, I could lose these things as well. That, that creeps in, and that temptation to be fearful and to let that consume us is very real. And so what we want to look at today as we approach Psalm 27 is how do we confront fear? How does God desire for us to look at fear and to face that in a way that he wants? And so we look at Psalm 27. Uh, if you look in your Bible, it says it's written by David. Different than some of the other psalms we've talked about the last couple weeks, this psalm, there's no uh, delineation as far as what type of psalm it is. We have no indication that this is a psalm that was a song that would be sung. We have no indication that this is like the word we talked about this morning, a selah or a maskal type psalm that we talked about a couple weeks ago. It just says it's a psalm of David. And so this really is David writing about really his interaction with fear. And we see, in some respects, he has confidence in God, and maybe he's overcome fear in some respects. But towards the middle and the end of the psalm, he's pleading with God. He's struggling and wrestling with this concept of fear and how he is interacting with it. And so he's wrestling just as we often wrestle. But if we understand that in Scripture, if everything in Scripture is inspired by God, then we understand even as David is struggling with this, this is God's heart for us as well. This is what God wants to communicate to us as we interact with fear, as we struggle with fear. And so as we look at how David responds, the things that he is crying out to God for in respect, this is what God wants to speak to us about as we handle fear. And so we want to look at that today. So, Pastor, share with us what that looks like. Thank you, Marcus. That was perfect. Um, this is really an, an honest cry from David as he struggles with fear, as he struggles to combat and to counter fear. And, and I love, as Marcus pointed out, it's also God's heart and his instruction for us as we deal with fear. Psalm 27. Interesting psalm. Uh, we just want to jump right in here with this psalm. Here's, here's how it reads, and it begins this, this way. way. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war arise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. I, I want to stop there and just kind of back up and, and look at that because David asked the question, whom shall I fear? And by the way, did you notice the poetic form there? We talked about that a little bit last week. Often we see it in, in Hebrew poetry, that poetic form there, the paired phrases as as the poet, the, the psalmist, even in Proverbs, we see it a lot. Um, they, they will make a statement, and then they'll say it again with slightly different words, and that's a poetic form. But it's more than a poetic form. This isn't David just following the formula of poetry. That, that paired phrase really serves for us as an intensifier. So when David says, the Lord is my light, and my salvation, whom shall I fear? And then, in essence, he says it again, whom shall I dread? Uh, it really begins to intensify this feeling. And we, I want to understand this, that David asks that question because he was. 
David asked, whom shall I fear? Because he was dealing with fear. This is not a case where David, the warrior king, is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm strong, I'm bold, I have nothing to be afraid of. Nobody scares me. Whom will I fear? It's just the opposite. This is David wrestling with that fear and asking himself, really, whom should I fear? And, and what do I fear? And why do I fear? Why do I struggle with this? Because the Lord is my light, my salvation. Why should I fear? Whom do I fear? You know, as I read that, um, I just, uh, and, and just forgive my, my wandering here and my, my manipulation of the verse, but as I read that, I, I made it personal. Whom shall I fear? And then I changed the word a little bit. I said, what should I fear? And what do I fear? And then my smart aleck response was, well, let me make you a list. <laughs> so I did. I made a list. And Marcus touched on it a little bit, and, and Matt touched on it a little bit. As I made the list, I, I came to realize, and, and this is just my, this is just my um, imagining and, and my work. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a, a psychologist, psychiatrist. But as I made this list, I realized that um, the things that I fear can fall into maybe one of six categories, and then with subcategories under that. And, and maybe the first one that we would all put on our list is death. Fear death. Fear we fear just that finality of death, but then maybe a subcategory of that is a manner of death. I I fear death by drowning. I fear death by whatever it is. Things scare me when I, when I think about that. And in, in even in that category, and we understand as Marcus spoke that we fear this when it comes to those who are close to us. I fear that, and it can be overwhelming. The second thing that I, I put on my list in the second category is that I fear failure. Just I'm, I'm afraid to fail. I, I'm afraid to, to be embarrassed. I'm afraid to be ridiculed. I'm afraid that maybe I'll attempt something and it doesn't come and people are disappointed or people are impacted by the fact that I couldn't do what I said I was going to do or what I was supposed to do. I fear failing people and disappointing people. Maybe another one that we would put on the list is I, I fear loss. And this was a big category because there are a lot of things that go under loss. And, of course, there's some crossover here between death and loss. But I, I, I fear loss. I, maybe it's I, I fear losing my possessions. I fear losing my position, my status. Maybe more important, I fear losing those who are close to me. I fear that loss. I, I fear losing my ability fear losing my health, although health is even another, another category. I, I just I don't want to be diminished. I, I'm afraid that what I enjoy now isn't going to last. And, and that can be overwhelming to me. Safety, health, well-being, the kind of one giant category here. But maybe it's not just death, but I, but I fear just a loss of health. I fear for my well-being, and I fear for the well-being of my family members. I, I fear that they might be a victim of, of violence. I fear for their safety as they, as they go out in the day. And you understand as we begin to dwell on this, it can be overwhelming. Fear for emotional well-being. I, I, just, I don't want my family to be sad. I fear that. I fear that they would be strong and courageous. I want them to be strong and courageous. I, I, I fear that something might diminish that. So it's, it's a threat to safety, it's health, it's well-being. On this list, I think we have to put the fear of the unknown. Just afraid of what might be. I, I don't even know what that might be is. And, you know, it can be anything from just being afraid of a dark situation because I don't know what's in there can imagine what's in there, but I don't know what's in there. I'm afraid of being surprised. I'm afraid of being shocked. I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid of the what if. It can be overwhelming. And then in my list, I had to add the sixth one, and it's just the creepy stuff. Spiders. Clowns. Thursday. 
Sometimes I'm afraid of Thursday. It's just creepy. I, you know, and we'd say, well, that's not rational. And rational or not, the fear is real, right? Might not be rational, but the fear is real. What shall I fear? You know, I, I made that list and realized, you know, when, when I fail to factor in God, these things can be overwhelming. Any one of these things can be overwhelming when I, fear, I fail to factor in God. It can be overwhelming and I can be paralyzed by that. But that's where we need to go with this because we need to factor in God because we have a God who must be factored in. And really I think that's what David struggles with is making sure that in his thinking and in his emotions, in his feelings, these things that would overwhelm, that he's always working to factor in the, the, this, this truth that there is a God who is for him. Let's read this, this psalm again and maybe kind of identify and just look. We're not going to point, we won't stop and point them out. But as we read, just see if you note what are the things that David is afraid of. Psalm 27 is the psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evil, evil doers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rises against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place in his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praise to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. And be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my enemies, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Some of the things we, we could identify what David was struggling with, and, and, and I hope that you got the sense of the struggle in that. So what is it that counters fear? What is it that we employ to combat fear? Well, as we look through this, there are some things I think we can point to. We, we counter fear by, number one, recalling the faithfulness of God. Look again at verses 2 and 3. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host camp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rises against me, in spite of this, I will be confident. Now, this is interesting here because in a, as we read this, it seems like David is changing the tense of his statement. It's past tense and then it's present tense. Some have looked at that and concluded that David is writing this after the fact. After he's come through the whole incident that he was afraid of, he's looking back and now he's saying, why was I ever afraid? It's one way to take that. But, but I think that David is writing this in the midst of that situation. And as we'll see here, maybe a couple different ways, he's still struggling with that situation. So how do we understand the fact that he points backwards and then he looks at his current situation? I, I think we take this just to say David is looking back and realizing that his past experience is going to lead to a present confidence in the Lord. And we read it that way. David says, now whom shall I fear? And now he's at work trying to remind himself of where he needs to be centered. He's right, reminding himself that God needs to be factored into this fearful situation. And so he looks back and he remembers what God has done for him in the past. When evildoers came upon me, 
to devour my flesh. My adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. I remember that. I remember God's goodness in that. I remember that there were other times when I was fearful, and, and as it turns out, I saw God at work. And, and I remember when, and therefore now, and that's really the contrast between verse 2 and verse 3. I remember when God did this for me before. I remember that God was faithful. Therefore, now I can be confident. I can be confident now, though a host camps against me. Though this multitude rises against me for war. And that's what David was facing. He says, but I'm going to remember God's faithfulness in the past. And in remembering God's faithfulness in the past, he remembers that God is greater than his fear and greater than the situation and greater than the circumstance and greater than the condition. That's who our God is. And so when he's looking back and remembering the faithfulness of God, really what he's doing is he's remembering the person of God, the nature of God, the character of God, the ability of God. Remembering just simply who God is. We know who he is because of the way he has acted in the past. It's a reminder that God is greater than any of those circumstances. Notice here too though, when David looked back, and he remembered what God had done for him before, there's an indication that God did not immediately remove the condition. God didn't immediately solve or remove the condition from David or remove David from the condition. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, we would love to say God just miraculously picked me out of there and everything was good. Now, when, when the en enemies came upon me to devour my flesh, my, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. It played out, but we saw God at work. When we deal with our fear, we have to realize that sometimes God allows that situation to play out. doesn't always immediately rescue us. He allows it to play out, but he's always in the midst of that provision. God did prove that he was faithful in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of, of that condition. So we counter fear, first of all, by just remembering God's faithfulness. I remember when, therefore now, I can be confident. There's another one that we see here. We see it in verses 4 and 5, and we, we counter fear by seeking and understanding the dwelling presence of God. Now this is interesting one thing, David says in verse 4, one thing I've asked from the Lord that I may, that, and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. Now, what is he saying there? I think this is more than David saying, you know, it would really be cool if I could just live in the temple. Mark has pointed out, you know, we spend a lot of time, it, living in the church isn't all that uh, wonderful. Spend the night here. It's a little creepy. Add that to the thing of, of list of, of to be afraid of. There are noises in this building that, we, yeah, especially at night in the dark. Is that what David is saying? You know, wouldn't it just be great if, uh, if I could be done with all the trouble and just live in the temple? Now, in a sense, we'd say, boy, that, that really would be good, wouldn't it? If we could huddle and uh, isolate and insulate and trouble never touches us and we'll just have our own, our own family here. Wouldn't that be great? No, not really. That's not what he's saying. You know what David is saying at this point is that there's something that he seeks. And what he's seeking is the dwelling presence of God. Not necessarily a place, but he wants the reality of the dwelling presence of God. Now, now in, in a sense, David is looking for the place. And, and in that circumstance, what does David most desire? We, we, we don't know the exact setting of this psalm, but we can imagine that he's on the run again, and he's been, uh, he's been denied his home and his family. He's been denied his friends and his, his companions. And in that season of loss, what does David long for most? It doesn't say, if I could just be at home again. 
if I could just be with my family, if I could just be with my mother and father again, and, and then it would be okay. It, what, what he says is, what I desire the most is being in the presence of God. I desire his dwelling presence with us. He uses the word in the Old Testament, tabernacle. It's interesting, it's really kind of the same idea that we see in the New Testament when we study the Gospel of John. Remember the opening of the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and nothing that has come, nothing has come into being that didn't come into being through him. I messed that up. But then in verse 14, and the Word, that dwelt with God from the beginning, the Word was made flesh and, what? Dwelt among us. Kind of that same idea, tabernacled with us. Dwelt with us. It was his dwelling presence with us. So we, we pull all of that in and to say this is one of the, the major tools, the major keys that we have in, in combating fear is just being aware of and loving and longing for the dwelling presence of God. To know his presence with us and, and to be reminded of that often that in this fearful situation I am not alone, I am not abandoned, I'm not isolated, but I have the dwelling presence of God. David goes on to use a couple other words and phrases here you know, to see the beauty of the Lord. And, you know, there is something incredibly beautiful and calming and peaceful even in the midst of turmoil to know that you are in the presence of God, to know his presence. Something beautiful and sweet in that condition. And then David uses this word to meditate. To meditate. And to meditate in his temple. No, when we use that word meditate in a biblical sense, it's not emptying your mind, but it's filling your mind. It's just the opposite. It's a very active mind to dwell on, to, to consider, to in some sense to wrestle with. David says, here's, here's how I'm going to combat fear. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to actively be aware of your dwelling presence with me as opposed to actively seeking and, and fretting over what might be. We seek his dwelling presence. Here's the third thing. We counter fear through praise and worship. And I think we see David do this at this point, that we counter with praise and worship. You know, praise and worship, um, well, it's just really an incredible tool that we have that God has given to us, this idea of praise and worship. And I think at this point we see David accessing that tool. In a sense, we read this psalm, we kind of feel like he's jumping all over the place. He's talking about fear, and then he's talking about what God has done in the past. And then in verse 6, we see David kind of breaking out into praise. Now, my head will be lifted above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to God. Here's David, just, he's doing, he's not just telling what he's going to do or what he did do, but this is what he is doing. He's accessing this, this praise. Here's the, here's the truth of it. Because worship is really the antithesis. It's the opposite of worry. Worship is the exact opposite of worry because worry focuses here. Worry focuses on what if. What if God doesn't? What if God doesn't protect me? What if God doesn't rescue me? What if God doesn't hear me? What should I be doing? Worry focuses on what if God doesn't. But worship focuses on that God is. And God has. And God will. And you see how those are completely opposite ends of this spectrum. And so as we begin to worship and we remember who God is and we remember what God has done and we look forward to what God will do, that has to dispel worry. Because you can't do, but what if God doesn't and but God is at the same time. Now, there's a constant battle going on there. And we're pretty good at fluctuating back and forth. But worship is the opposite of worry. Because worship reminds us of who God is. It's a great tool to remind us of who God is. And by the way, that's why it's so important for us to memorize Scripture. Because as we memorize and we 
we recite, as we read scripture, we are in that sense reminding ourselves of who God is. Do you not know? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. What a great tool that has just become for us in combating worry. And not just scripture, and I, I understand I don't put these on the same plane, but song. Songs and hymns and spiritual songs do the same thing for us. How, how often do you just pull out a song when God is dealing and when you're, when you're worried and when, when you're stressed? That, that song will come out and maybe just one phrase of the song over and over again. Why is that effective? Because it reminds us of who God is. By the way, understand this, please, that, that praise is not pretense. There's a difference. So when we praise God, it's not a pretense that everything is okay. Woohoo, God, everything's good. <laughs> it's not pretending that everything is fine. Worship and pretense are not the same thing. But worship and praise says, I choose to focus on who God is at this moment. I struggle to focus on who God is. And by the way, in the next verses, I, I hope you notice just the very real struggle that David goes through. Look at verse 6 compared to verse 7. Verse 6 says, And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praise to the Lord. Then verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. Can you see that? Almost in the same breath, David says, I'm going to praise the Lord, but God, what are you doing? I don't understand what you're doing. I'm going to praise the Lord, I'm going to praise the Lord, but God... You just seem so distant to me right now. I love the next verse. Verse 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. You, you understand? God says, here's what you need to do. Seek my face. And my heart says, absolutely, God, I am seeking your face. And then look at verse 9. Do not hide your face from me. God, you said, seek your face. And so now I'm going to seek your face. But why are you hiding your face from me? See the struggle that's going on in David's heart right now? David doesn't have it all figured out. This isn't a psalm that said, here's how I dealt with it, and now it's not a problem anymore. Here's a psalm that said, where David is saying, this is where I struggle every day. But worship and praise give us that tool, gives us that answer. Here's the next thing. We'll look at these next two kind of quickly. But the fourth thing is um, ask the right questions. How do I counter fear? Well, I counter fear by asking the right questions. And by asking the right questions, I have the right focus. Jump down to verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the level path because of my foe. Now, you say, well, where, where's the question there? In a sense, this is the this is, um, same truth that we memorized last month, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So it's the same truth. Lean not on your own understanding. Teach me your ways, O Lord, because in making that statement, there's this understanding that my understanding is flawed. My understanding is going to get me into trouble. My understanding brings me no hope because what I understand is this situation is terrible and there's no hope. That's my understanding. But teach me your way, O oh Lord. Teach me your understanding. I don't want to lean on my own understanding. I want your understanding. And as, I want, and as, and as you give me your understanding, then I will know how I need to conduct my steps then I'll know how I need to live this out. How do I walk through this God? And that really comes to the question. The right question is, how do I walk through this? Now, as we do this, and the same with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we understand that the level path is not the same as the easy path. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, he will make your way straight. That's not a promise that he makes your way easy. 
But it's an indication that God is going to show you step by step where you need to go, where you need to tread. And I think it's the same indication here. Teach me your way, O Lord. Leave me, lead me in that level path. Show me the path. Show me that step before me. Show me where you need me to go. And that really becomes the question, not God, why are you doing this to me? Or God, what's the answer to this? Or God, how are you going to get me out of this? But the right question that begins to counter our fear is, God, how do I walk in this? Lead me in the way that I need to walk. How do I walk through this? Where do you want me to be? I don't understand it. And my understanding is, is flawed anyway. So you teach me. You teach me where you want me to walk. Now, be careful with this a little bit because, again, we could get this wrong and we could get this twisted that the, the level path is an easy path and, and we could easily misconstrue this verse to teach me your ways and then my life will be easy. My life is hard because I don't know enough about Jesus, so if I just had more biblical knowledge, then things would get better. If I just knew more, then I'd have an easy path and I'm going through terrible times, so I must try harder, I must do more, I must be better, I must try harder. It's not about doing more and being better and trying harder. It's about seeking God to say, okay, where, where is my next step? Next footfall. What is it that I need to focus on? And when I'm focusing there again, it's not on the situation, but on what God wants to do in me and through me in that situation. Here's the fifth thing that I think David points out. It's right at the end. We counter fear through faith in the present goodness of God. In the present goodness of God. Verse 13. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We saw that, ver that phrase last time, didn't we? I, I would have despaired unless I had seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, we come to those fears. And if we don't factor in God, it would be easy to despair. And, and in fact, if, if God is not in this equation, if God is not a factor in this, then we probably should despair because that's the only thing left for us. But we need to factor in who God is. We need to factor in the fact that, that God is faithful. And the fear isn't the only element here. It's not the only factor. It's something that's very real in our life at the moment. But there's something even greater than that. That God is more powerful than the thing that I face. And we have to factor that in. But we factor in, as David says, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's his present goodness. Now, it, it would be one thing to, to say, well, you know, someday we all get to go to heaven. We, we, we'll all go to heaven. And someday in heaven, it's going to be okay. All problems will be solved. Then we'll get to know the goodness of God. And by the way, that's true. Not that everybody goes to heaven, by the way. But w when we go to heaven, there, there's no more hurting there. There's no more fear there. It's, it's good. And we get to know the goodness of God. But it's not just in heaven. It's not just that vague, someday it's all going to work out. But at this moment right now, God is good. And he wants you to know his goodness now. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, and it doesn't mean he's, he, he wants you to be uh, comfortable or enjoy luxury or opulence or excess. But he wants you to know his goodness. And David says, I would have despaired until unless I factored in this that, I expect to see the goodness of God here and now and today. God, show me your goodness. And when we focus on that, we counter that fear. Fear and worry focus on what if God fails me. Just like worship and praise, we focus on, but this is who God is. This is what he does, what he did and what he will and in that struggle, we can have confidence and we can come back to that point of, of being confident even though war swirls around us, even though we are faced with suffering loss, 
Even though there's much that is unknown, that is scary to us, we know that there's something that is unchanging. There is a factor in all of that that is undeniable, and that's the presence of God. Amen? Doesn't mean God removes the fear, but he's present in every circumstance. Father, we thank you for that truth. We thank you that you are a God who is big and that you have shown that over and over again. We thank you for the stories of the way you work in mighty ways. We thank you for the examples of the way you have worked in our lives collectively and individually. And we would come back and cling to that as our situation would be overwhelmed. Father, we thank you that you know where we are. We thank you that you are the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. When we factor all of those things, we would come back and say, okay, what is it that we're really afraid of? And maybe, Father, the thing that we need to be afraid of is we need to fear you and fear not honoring you and fear walking away from you. Fear not knowing your goodness in all things. Be with us, Father, as we struggle with that because that's a reality of the day in which we live. Be a reminder of your presence always. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.